Hooters is a wonderful example of where we saw this happen. There was a person overserved. Unfortunately, they left, they drove, they actually ended up getting into an accident with a cop. And so now we have very stronger laws in Maryland with regard to drinking and driving. And a lot of it associates with if you get into a situation where you're operating a vehicle and you should not be even drinking, you can have you can be required to put a breathalyzer into your car in order to even get the car to operate. And it's much longer that you'll lose your license now as a result. Go ahead, Deborah. So even the restaurant can be responsible. Even the restaurant can be responsible because they're gonna say the restaurant, like the fraternity, like the school has a responsibility to make sure that they have good policies and training in place to prevent this type of conduct. So you'll see when we get to agency law, you can be vicariously liable. You can be responsible for the behavior of people who are acting on your behalf. So again, under negligence, remember, there's four required elements, which are duty of care. You have an obligation that you break, and it causes harm. So we looked at duty of care in terms of this fraternity party, who can be responsible. I want to talk to you a little bit about duty of care in terms of your property. So landowners have a duty of care, and it kind of starts here with a very low duty. You have very low obligations to people who are trespassing on your property. Down to here, it's in red. You have a very high obligation if you invite somebody for a monetary benefit. So at the top here, even if someone's trespassing on your land, they're on your land and they're not supposed to be, you have an obligation to them not to injure them intentionally. That means there should not be any artificial or like concealed kind of holes for them to fall into. So if you think about that, if I you know, go into my yard and I put this hole in the ground and I cover it with like this blanket that looks like grass, someone's trespassing and they fall and they get hurt in that hole, I can be responsible even if they were on my land trying to steal things where they shouldn't have been there. So you have an obligation not to have like highly dangerous things going on on your property even if someone's trespassing. You can sue them for trespass. We learned last week as an intentional tort. They can sue you and you could be liable if they get hurt while they're trespassing. So be careful about that. Question, oh, so Delia. like the, when snow, snow time and you, if you don't clean your, clean your driveway. Really good point. So Delia said when it starts snowing and you don't clean your driveway or your walkways, this is where you can be responsible as well. Okay? In general, you have an obligation. I'm going to talk about children in a minute to people invited onto your property, even solicitors. If you don't leave a notice on your door saying no solicitors, even people who are trying to just come to ask you about fundraising, but friends who invite over to your property, you're supposed to warn them of known but hidden dangerous conditions. So if you have a lot of snow on your walkways, there could be hidden ice underneath. They could fall and get hurt. So you have an obligation to warn them. You should put a sign up that says, hey, slippery, or you need to remove the snow. That's just for friends you invite over. If you invite somebody over for an economic benefit, so something like a retail store like Apple, you have a responsibility to make sure that you exercise reasonable care to protect against dangerous conditions that you should know about. Okay? Whether you know or not, you should know that it's dangerous. You have an obligation to warn them. And it's easy. You can satisfy that obligation by either fixing the problem, remove the snow, or warn them. So you've probably seen this before at Montgomery College in the hallways when they mop the floors. What do they put down on the floors? A sign and it says, careful, slippery with wet, a duh, right? The floor is slippery, but you might not see that there's water on the floor. So they put a sign there, they've met this obligation. They're inviting you, not only as a social guest, but really as a customer, being here on campus. You pay to be here and take classes. They have a very high duty to make sure that they're taking care of any known dangers or dangers they should have known about. Now here's something funky. Remember, in tort law, we're talking about wrongs, and generally we look to precedent to figure out what the law is. We look to prior cases for tort law, so it varies by state. I'm giving you kind of the general rules. I'll let you know when there's a difference in Maryland. Here's an example where there's a difference. In some states, you have a duty to children if you have a man-made object on your land. So if you put something like that trampoline on your property, it's called like an attractive nuisance. So if a child goes and they're like, oh, there's a trampoline, and they go and they're jumping on the trampoline and they get hurt, you can be responsible, even if you did not invite that child over. They snuck in. Same if you have a pool and people sneak in to use your pool and they get hurt, you could be responsible. It's an attractive nuisance. Okay? It's like they saw Disneyland and just couldn't help themselves. So in terms of this duty, this does not apply in Maryland. 
that some states, based on prior law in Maryland, we treat children like adults. Same kind of obligations that we have to adults on our land, we have to children. Go ahead. Wouldn't like, uh, wouldn't I guess the parents or the legal guardians of the children be responsible for that? Great if question. Like so could parents? the parents be responsible? They could. If they, they could. I'll show you in a moment. In Maryland, <clears throat> we allow parents to be vicariously liable for their children's actions. So some of the things, for example, if a child caused damage to that home, parents can be vicariously liable simply because they have a parent-child relationship with the children for up to $10,000 of that vandalism. So yes, the, the parents could also be responsible. I get this question all the time, so I want to address it with you. The Maryland Castle Doctrine and the Stand Your Ground laws here in Maryland. So I get this all the time. I just told you you have an obligation to trespassers, not to injure them intentionally. So what if someone's breaking into your home at 2 in the morning and you are worried for your life? Do you have a right to stand your ground? We've seen a lot of this in the media, so I want to address it with you, what the law is here in Maryland. In Maryland, we have what's called a castle doctrine. What that means is if you are inside your home and you feel like there's deadly force coming at you, someone comes into your home and they have a knife or they have a gun, you can defend yourself immediately. You have no obligation to retreat or to run away. If you are outside your home, we are not what's known as a stand your ground state. Okay, We do not have stand your ground protection. So what that means is self-defense outside of your home, you have an obligation to try to retreat rather than shooting somebody or taking a knife to them. You have an obligation. If you can run away from that harm, you need to try to run away first. Because we don't want to cause additional harm. People make mistakes all the time. You know, I'll give you an example. My brother, someone was trespassing at his home. It was an older gentleman. They got home, and he was sitting in their kitchen. Did he, was he trying to steal anything? No. He thought he actually thought he was in his own home. Okay, he was a little confused, and he thought he had gone into his own home. Lock your doors, okay? <laughs> and so if they all of a sudden go after him with deadly force, I mean, that would be a little intense. But you also want to think of this in terms of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, he's there, he's not doing anything hostile. The fact that he's in your home might seem hostile. That doesn't mean you need to immediately get out a gun. But you might protect yourself by having something ready. And in your home, you're allowed to take whatever force, you know, they're kind of coming at you with. So if he's running at them with a knife, they can certainly fight for their lives. Stand your ground says if you're outside your home and you can run away, run away. Okay. So if you want more information on that, there's a link for the Maryland law in that regard. Now I got a couple questions of who else could be responsible. This is called vicarious liability. So in some cases, if you have a special relationship with the person, the tortfeasor, the person doing something wrong, you can be responsible. So for example, when we get to agency law, we'll talk about companies. Employers can be liable for the actions, the wrong actions of their employees. When they're acting within the scope of employment, they're doing something when they're on the job for the employer. If they do something wrong, the employer can be responsible as well. Auto owners are generally not responsible if you lend someone your car. However, if they're doing an errand for you, that creates an agency relationship. Again, when we talk about agency law, you'll see this further. If someone's doing an errand for you in your car, you could be responsible if something happens, if they do something wrong. Parents, this goes to Henry's question, generally are not vicariously liable for the things their kids do wrong. They're not going to be responsible just because their kids are messing up or being a bad parent. In Maryland, though, we have precedent that says you can be liable for willful or malicious torts of your children. Your children really intend harm. So example of that is vandalism at a school. There was graffiti here at Montgomery College a few years ago over in the campus center. And whoever engaged in that graffiti, their parents could be responsible up to $10,000 based on our precedent here in Maryland. So why do we not just go after the person who does something wrong? Why are we trying to go after under vicarious liability these other people? Thank you so much, Jeffrey. They have more money. Okay, so yes, we can go after the person who did the wrong, but we can also go after these people who have deeper pockets. Sometimes that's the way to get the damages, the money that we want. Now, I know we've talked about this before. Just as a reminder, the affirmative, affirmative duty to act. I've mentioned this before. You see a car on fire. In general, do you legally have an obligation to help them? No. no. So you cannot prove someone negligent for failing to stop and help this burning car in Maryland. 
So if you're interested, the Good Samaritan Law is here for Maryland. I know we've discussed this before, just showing you what that looks like. And this tells you, you know, who could be responsible. And I'll tell you for each of you, if you start to help somebody and you are grossly negligent, meaning you had an obligation when you start to help them and you fail to help them, you fail to treat them the way a reasonable person would be, then you could be liable. So if you don't want to help the burning car legally, you don't have to. Ethically, should you? We've talked about that. Yeah. If you start to try to help somebody, you got to do what a reasonable person would do in your efforts. So an example of this, and we're back to that party on a college campus. It's December, January, and there's snow everywhere. And your friend is really, really hurt. They're at the party, they drank way too much, and they fall, they're dancing on this table, and they fall and they hit their head. And there's blood, and you're going, oh my gosh, you know, I, oh my God, we need to help them. So you get them into a car, and you and your friends race them to a hospital. But as you're approaching the hospital, you go, oh my goodness, you know, we've been drinking, we should not have been driving. And I don't want to walk into the hospital like that. They'll see that we're drunk and we might get in trouble. And so, you know what? Instead of actually bringing this person, our friend, inside the hospital to get help, let's leave them in the parking lot. Someone will find them and bring them inside the door. And then we don't get in trouble, right? So they leave this person in the parking lot. And then that person, overnight, freezes to death. Because it's cold. It's December. It's January. And they never did make it inside the hospital. Would a reasonable person have left them outside the hospital? So that's my example. No, don't be grossly negligent. If you go to help someone, make sure that you do what a reasonably prudent person would do. Going back to our overview here, we've looked at our obligations to help people. The next element to prove somebody is negligent is that they broke that obligation. This is the point in the case where you say, you did something wrong. You explain why it was wrong. So for example, when you are driving, what do you have a duty to do? What does a reasonable driver have to do? I hear a lot of comments. Just raise your hand. Go ahead, Eduardo. Uh, um, pay attention. Uh, Good. Pay attention. Drive safely, right? Mm -hmm. So don't speed. Pay attention. It could be distracted driving. We have a law in Maryland not to even have your phone in your hand. So you absolutely should not be texting. Or she, she's, she doesn't have it in her hand, but she's got it on her ear, right? Okay. You should not be using a mobile device while operating a vehicle. In Maryland, it's against the law. But also things that are okay, like eating, that can be distracting. You know, playing with your radio, playing with your phone, the GPS on your phone or on your regular GPS, that can be distracting. You have an obligation, as Eduardo said, to drive safely. So how is she breaking that obligation in this picture? What's she doing? Raise your hand. And someone who hasn't gotten the chance yet today. Go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, she's putting on, it looks like she looks like lipstick. She's putting on lipstick. Does that seem like a safe thing to do? Where should both of her hands be? On the wheel, right? So that would be the right way to do things. And should she have a phone like that on her ear? No. No. So to be a safe driver, you want both your hands on the wheel. You should be giving your full attention to the road. She's distracted. So that's how we say she broke her obligation. Just need to explain what they're doing wrong. Now, there's a couple small areas of this I'm going to talk to you about. This is very, very rare. And I don't expect you to know how to pronounce it. It's known as res ipsa loquitur. Very, very rarely, but in some cases, you do not have to prove that someone broke their obligation. We'll know that they broke it. So you, remember, we everyone's innocent until proven guilty. They're innocent until you can prove they're liable for negligent. They didn't do anything wrong. We don't have to prove that an obligation was broken under res ipsa loquitur in these very rare situations. Mostly it applies to a doctor, a surgeon, a coma. So I'll give you an example. My friend Jeff, his mother had a C-section. She had a baby and they had to you know, cut open her stomach to take the child out. Ten years later, after they've, she's had the child, they sew her back up, she's good, they find scissors in her stomach. Ooh. Would a normal person have scissors in their stomach? No. So you go into surgery, stomach nice and regular, right? You go out of surgery, there's scissors there. Did they break an obligation? Under rest of Salopita, we're going to assume so. We don't have to prove anything. The fact that there were scissors in there, all of a sudden, after the surgery, we don't need to get a bunch of testimony from the doctors involved in that and the surgeons involved in that. We're just going to assume something, was, an obligation was broken. Another way that you can just assume an obligation was broken is under negligence per se. So this says, in special cases, when a law exists to protect against something, 
For instance, when we say children should be out past 11 o'clock at night, there's a curfew. Then you might not have to prove that an obligation was broken. We're moving on to element number three. So duty of care, you broke that duty. We're on to causation. It has to actually cause some type of harm. If you're driving the way this woman is, but you don't actually get into an accident, she has an obligation to drive safely. She broke it, but she doesn't cause any harm. There's really no liability there. It actually has to be some type of harm. So here under causation, the injury must have been caused by that wrongful conduct. If it's caused by that wrongful conduct, we say it's factual causation. Okay, there's two types here. Factual causation, if it's foreseeable that that wrong act would have caused this type of harm, it's also proximate causation. So let me break that down for you with an example. Mechanic fails to fix a customer's brake. A reasonable mechanic should do what when fixing customer's brake? Fix them, yeah, fix them properly or notify you if they can. But you think your mechanic fixed your brakes and they didn't. As a result of that, you go to slam on the brakes, it doesn't break and the, there's a car accident between a bicyclist and a car. Now, is this factual causation and proximate causation? One or the other, both, neither? What do you think? Factual, proximate. So you think factual and proximate? Yeah. So why is it factual? The brakes didn't work. The brakes didn't work, right? The brakes not working is what caused this harm. It's factual. How do we know it's proximate? Thanks, Riley. It's foreseeable. foreseeable, right? It's foreseeable if you fail to fix someone's brakes that they could not slam on the brakes and get into an accident. So in this case, it's both factual and proximate. Well, now imagine the same kind of situation. There's a noise from the accident that startles somebody nearby and they fall over. Is this factual, proximate, or both? So I heard, why is it factual? What caused that person to fall? The noise. The noise from the accident, which was caused by the brakes, right? Not working. So absolutely here, that they wouldn't have fallen had that accident not happened from the brakes not working. It's not proximate though. Now we're kind of stretching things too far. It's like the butterfly effect, right? Just because you're nearby an accident and maybe you fall over from it, you know, that's kind of stretching it too far. It's not foreseeable that there'd be all this other damage in addition to the accident. On top of that, a car accident, um, the car doesn't actually hit the bicyclist. So because the bicyclist didn't get hit, they continue on on their journey and then they hit a pothole and crash, that wouldn't be factual or proximate. And now we're doing too many like if then what would happen, it's just kind of stretching it too far. Remember the injury, the wrongdoing has to actually cause injury and it needs to be foreseeable, both factual and proximate. And then there simply has to be harm. You have to be able to show there was some type of harm that was a result of that, that's the fourth element. Now, I do wanna talk about this piece because this happens a lot. People are nearby when these bad things happen, right? There can be bystanders. So if you see an accident happen, is that shocking? Yeah, it's scary. Does it ruin your day? Yeah. Are you the one in pain? No. And if we allowed everyone who saw an accident to go suing everyone involved, the courts would be even more flooded, right? However, there is precedent that says if you are a bystander, you don't have any physical harm, but you're distressed, as long as you're near the accident, you actually have immediate shock from it, and you are a close relative, you may also have a claim that you were harmed, that there's negligence here as a bystander. But the close relative piece is important. So the case that made this precedent, it's a really, really gross, but there's a mother and their kid on an elevator, and the elevator gets stuck. And so they go to take the child out from the elevator, they're lifting him out, oh. and the elevator snaps, and the kid's body literally cuts him. That's gruesome just hearing about it, right? So that doesn't seem fair for the mom to not be able to say, hey, you were negligent. You had a duty to safely pull the child out of the elevator and you broke that obligation and it caused harm to my, my child. Because of that case, as a bystander, that mom can prove negligence. She can prove harm by saying, I was near the scene of the injury. Yes, that would cause someone immediate shock. And because she's a relative, we're gonna assume that was a pretty harmful amount of distress to see that. Where this doesn't apply is something like the September 11th terrorist attacks. You see them on the news. You can't have all the millions of viewers watching things on the news every time something bad happens, claiming I was a bystander, I was distressed by that, so I'm gonna sue. 
here, you have to be near the scene of the injury. So now we're going to talk about defenses. Can you be sued for negligence? Absolutely. You can have an obligation you broke that caused harm, but there are some defenses to it. And one of them is, what if you're both to blame? What if you both were doing something wrong? So I have an example of this to share with you. There's two types of negligence. Most states use what's called comparative negligence. Maryland and just a few other states follow contributory negligence. Comparative negligence says that in most states, you're responsible for the amount of liability you caused. I'm responsible only the proportion of the harm I caused if somebody else was failing to meet their obligations as well. So here's an example. I hope I have some Big Bang Theory fans. Leonard drives through a stop sign, so he should not have done that, right? At a stop sign, you're supposed to stop. Did he do something wrong? So he's negligent. He had an obligation to stop. He failed to stop. It can cause harm. He got in an accident. Penny is speeding. So what obligation is she breaking? Yeah, so she's speeding. She's breaking her obligation to drive safely. So she sues for negligence, but they both did something wrong. The court recognizes that. Under comparative negligence, they say, you know what, Leonard's 60% at fault. Penny's 40% at fault. Leonard's more at fault. He should have stopped at the stop sign, but Penny's also 40% at fault for speeding. And the court says there's $10,000 in damages total. Remember, Leonard's responsible for 60% of these. So how much money could Penny recover under comparative negligence? Good job, Jeffrey said $6,000. Why can't she get the full $10,000? She's also at fault, 40%. Okay, so under this, most states follow this. If you get into an accident, you're both doing something wrong, you only are able to collect up to the part that you are not responsible. Eduardo. Just in No, so. Maryland follows this. Very few states do, but Maryland follows what's called contributory negligence. So same scenario here. Lender drives through a stop sign, Penny speeding, they get into an accident, there's $10,000 of damages. How much money can Penny collect in Maryland? Zero dollars. So that is something you elect. You see on the exam, it's very important you understand that distinction in various states. Okay, based on precedent, most states follow comparative negligence. You can get proportionally what you are able what harm you did not cause. In Maryland, you are barred from recovery if you were doing something wrong too. So that can be a defense. There's another defense called assumption of the risk. So again, you can be sued for negligence. An organization can be sued for having an obligation that they broke that caused harm. They can say, yep, yeah, we did that, but I'm gonna defend myself by saying, you voluntarily entered a risky situation. You knew it was dangerous. Okay, so an example of that, you know, you have to know and appreciate the risk and voluntarily encounter it. My husband has never, had never been sledding before. So, you know, you don't know exactly how old I am, but we're old enough, we probably should have gone sledding, right? So I'm like, oh, that's so sad. You know, you're so neglected. You didn't get to go sledding. So a couple years ago for his birthday, I took him to one of the ski resorts near here to go sledding. Okay, so I, we went on one of those, um, you know, like the, the snow tubes and went tubing down. Now, you should be laughing because, imagine this. The oldest kid was probably like this tall, and then there's me and my husband. I'm like, hey, we're gonna go snow tubing too. And all these little kids are tubing down the hill. But I told you, we never got to go sledding as a kid, so we were fulfilling that dream. When we went to go, they made a sign something that said, you may be harmed by tubing down the hill, right? The tube could flip over, you could sprain your ankle. So they're warning us of that. That way, if we sue them for negligence, had he got hurt tubing down the hill, they can say, you knew and appreciated the risk because we gave you this document that says you couldn't get hurt. And you said okay, and voluntarily did it anyway, knowing that risk was involved. Same kind of thing if you've ever had surgery or know someone that has, they'll usually go through all the risks, like you have a 0.002% chance of dying from the anesthesia. And they'll tell you this before you're going in there, which is really comforting. And then you voluntarily encounter that risk. It's just a defense that you have. Again, it doesn't mean you're gonna win, you can say, even if I was negligent, you knew that it was risky. You encountered that anyway. So I have an example of this to show you. You know I'm a big Red Sox fan, I'm sure, by now. This is a movie called Fever Pitch. Let's talk 
talk about this. Remember, assumption of the risk is a defense here. She's at Fenway Park in Massachusetts watching a Red Sox game. She gets hit in the head by a baseball. Is Fenway Park negligent? Could this sign I want to hit? So, so go ahead, Javon. We want to say they're negligent. What do we say? Go ahead. They could be. They could be. It depends, right? That's always the answer. Depending on the judge or jury, they could be. What duty did they have then? have an obligation to like keep the customers, the fans safe. How did they break that obligation? What should they have done differently? This is hard. They should have made uh, uh, make uh, a big net, right? Net. They could have done a better net, or they could have supplied helmets. You'll see parents there with little kids sometimes at these games with helmets on their kids. This is why. Okay, they could have given them helmets. So they broke that, and it did it cause some harm. Yeah, Drew Barry Ward's you know, in a, a machine getting, getting checked for brain damage. That's not great. Fenway is going to defend and say, under assumption of the risk, what do we have to prove? The answer's always on the screen, right? Do you know and appreciate the risk of a ball hitting you in the head when you go to a baseball game? Yeah. Do you voluntarily encounter it? Do you still go? Yeah. So they can say, well, you assume the risk. This is actually going on right now. There's like a nine-year-old at a Yankees game that got hurt in this same, same exact scenario that's going on right now. Go ahead, Javon. More net that. You don't get to catch that foul ball anymore. And that's what you'll see happen. If an injury happens like this, if they do get in trouble, they'll make some changes to the way, unfortunately, you watch the game. So here, knowing and appreciating the risk, oftentimes you'll see stuff like this on the tickets too. The tickets that will be like, hey, you could get hurt. And that way they can defend themselves and say, you knew, you knew a baseball could fly into the, to the you know, stands and you wouldn't have fun. So that's another defense we have. So we've talked about intentional torts, meaning that you intended an act that caused harm. Things like defamation, okay, things like false imprisonment, things like assault and battery. Then we talked about another group of wrongs or torts called negligence, okay, where you had an obligation, you broke it, and it caused harm. The last group of torts is known as strict liability. That's the last thing we're going to talk about in terms of net, in terms of torts today. Strict liability is activities that are so dangerous the law imposes a really, really high burden on them. They say you're going to be responsible if someone's harmed even if there was no intent to harm and even if you did everything you were obligated to do. Okay, Even if there's negligence, you're still going to be responsible. If there's harm, whether you meant it or not, whether you checked all the boxes and did your due diligence, you're responsible for that harm. So strict liability, I give you an example of this to shock you and hopefully help you remember it. There are statutory rape laws in various states, they, they vary, okay, but in general the idea is that an adult, someone of about 18 and older, should not be having sexual relations with a child. And the age of the child varies in some states. Some states it's like 12, some states it's 14, some states it's like there shouldn't be you know, more than two years between you. And so that seems reasonable, right? Like, you know, probably not a great idea for an 18-year-old to be having sex with a 12-year-old. Agreed? Yeah, everyone's not great. So the problem with this is it's a strict liability crime. So I want to make sure you understand what strict liability is. Again, it's so dangerous, so harmful, that whether or not you intended the harm, or even if you had an obligation and you met it, you weren't negligent, you could still be responsible. So if an 18-year-old has sex with a 12-year-old who shows them their ID, they're at a college party. They think that child is 18. They've done their due diligence, right? They're not negligent. They had an obligation not to sleep with kids, and they checked. If it turns out that they had sex with that child who's 12, even if they thought they were 18, even if they checked and had you know documents showing they were 18, they will be strictly liable for that conduct. Now, is it as bad as the person who intentionally knows they're 12 years old? Absolutely not. But it's a strict liability crime they will still be responsible for statutory rape because the fact is they had a sexual encounter with a child, even if they did everything they could and did not think that they were doing that. Scary, right? Yeah, be careful who you have sex with, right? Defective products, we're going to move on to the business side of that, are strict liability as well. Some products that businesses put out there are so harmful, they have so much risk, that even if the business does everything they're supposed to, they'll be responsible for the harm from it. So two examples of defective products. First of all, this has to be a merchant. This has to be someone who routinely sells these goods. 
So for all of you, you know, if you have this laptop and you go to sell the laptop to your friend or sell it on eBay or Craigslist, are you a merchant? No, because you're not routinely selling laptops to lots and lots of people. It's not your business. A merchant has to be someone who's really involved in the sale of those goods regularly. A merchant can be liable under strict liability if there's evidence that a product is defective. Now, it has to have not been altered since it left their hands. If you go and you take your car and you like put special rims on it and change the engine and do all this stuff on it, it's really not what the, the factory produced. So it's not really fair to hold them liable when you've made all those changes. The use also has to be foreseeable. So they made a defective product. It hasn't changed since they made it, so no one's altering it, causing problems. But it also has to be a foreseeable use, and I want you to understand that doesn't mean an intended use. So for example, I want to not get hurt here, what is the in foreseeable use of this chair? Wow, this is heavy. What is the foreseeable use of this chair? Sit. Sit down, right? Take a seat. Um, is it foreseeable that I might stand on this chair if I need to reach something on the ceiling? No, not with no. heels on, I'm not that dumb, but is it foreseeable? No, probably not. Is it possible that someone might stand on a chair if they're trying to reach something? Anyone yes. ever done that before? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So understand there's a difference between intentional use. The intended use of the chair is to sit. We say anything you're using that's foreseeable is also included here. So if you're standing on the chair, it's foreseeable you would do that. You could be responsible as well. There's two types of defects or products. One is a manufacturing defect. This means the product differs from the intentional design in an unsafe way. So for example, General Motors created a lot of cars and unfortunately the ignition switch was faulty. And it was a matter of change to fix the ignition switch to get the car to work properly. That was a manufacturing defect. Unfortunately, the airbag, the ignition switch wouldn't work, the airbag didn't deploy, the wheel would lock up, and there were many, many deaths and injuries as a result. That is what we call a manufacturing defect. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. General Motors will be responsible for any harm. Did they intend to hurt those people? Probably not. But they designed a product that was dangerous. So we're going to hold them liable. The design defect's a little different. This is more like a hypothetical situation where you're saying, it's not that you made a bad product, it's just there could have been a safer one. And it's really not that expensive for you to have done it. It's kind of like this alternative product. We're saying it's a design defect. So for example, you make this saw and there's no safety clip on top of it, someone could hurt their finger. It would not cost a ton of money to add some plastic to that so they don't hurt their finger. They're gonna argue there's a design defect. I have an example from General Motors to show you. I'm gonna put this on the board. Anyone know the show last week tonight with John Oliver from HBO? If you don't know it, I'll put it on the screen. This is a clip from it, it's about two minutes long. I use a lot of clips from that show. They address a lot of the issues we talk about in this class in kind of a more humorous way. For those of you who kind of want to know what's going on but don't have time to check the news every single day, last week tonight does a recap of the global news in a funny way, and they have a lot of money to put towards it. And so you could watch that. It's only a half hour long. And if you don't have HBO, that's okay. They post all this kind of stuff on YouTube they like to share. So I'll put this on the board for you. Um, this is, if you're interested in those General Motors recalls about that ignition switch, there's more information there, and this is a video about that issue. You'll see Mary Barr on the screen right here. Just this Friday, we learned that GM was holding meetings at the time about dealing with their defective cars, but you'll never guess what they were talking about. These are slides from a PowerPoint presentation given in 2008. Workers were told not to use the word defect or defective, but rather does not perform to design. And GM had judgment words that were banned, including dangerous, criminal.